Nobody expected Fallout New Vegas to still be relevant almost a decade after it launched. However, not only is it still very much relevant, over the years fans have come to accept Obsidian Entertainment's follow-up as being not only part of the main series, but perhaps the best installment in the entire franchise, or barring that, certainly the best one since Bethesda took over. That's partly because the team was made up of people who worked on the original games, returning to their franchise that had since been retooled. As you can imagine then, it was a very strange development period, and while New Vegas has gone down as a beloved cult classic with a rabid fanbase since, there are so many interesting facts from that production that even diehard fans like me might not have known. I'm Josh from WhatCulture.com and these are 12 things you didn't know about Fallout New Vegas. Number 12. There are so many celebrity voice actors. Video games always like to get a few celebrities involved so they have an extra thing to market, and New Vegas drafted in Chandler Bing himself, Matthew Perry, to play the villain as Benny. Though that appointment stole the headlines, there were actually a whole bunch of celebrity voice actors hired for roles across the RPG. The other biggie is Chris Christopherson, and yes, I absolutely regretted sending his character off to jail as soon as I realised who was behind the voice, and real-life Mr. Las Vegas Wayne Newton, who doubled as radio host Mr. New Vegas. On top of that, Danny Trejo, Rene Aubergenois, Felicia Day, Zachary Levy, John Dorman, Michael Dawn, William Sadler, Rob Codry, Alex Rocco, Will Wheaton, and Zoe Bell all have their own roles. Even Dave Foley, the voice of Flick in A Bug's Life, showed up at one point. Number 11, the narrator is an actual hidden character, kind of. One celebrity I just missed off that list is Ron Perlman, because while he is certainly a big deal, he's always reprised his role as the narrator across the Fallout series. An in-game face has never been put to the voice though, and he's acted as the invisible, almost omniscient god of the universe for years. However, through a bug, players realised they could break out of New Vegas' ending slideshow sequence to find a character they were never meant to see. Ron, the narrator. He's just a placeholder character so that Ron Perlman's voice could be played in-game rather than a cutscene, but he does kinda look like someone Ron Perlman would play, maybe bar the Centurion armor. Even better though, there's actually one of these placeholder characters in all of the DLC slideshows as well, and they all change appearance depending on the theme of the content. Number 10, most of the game is based on concepts for the original Fallout 3. As mentioned in the introduction, it's pretty well known that Obsidian Entertainment in 2011 housed former Black Isle developers, the studio which created Fallout in the first place. Consequently, while New Vegas was indeed a spin-off, it was being made by people who knew the franchise arguably even better than Bethesda. And before Black Isle went bust, they did plan for a Fallout 3 set in the style of the old games, and while the isometric gameplay couldn't be transferred over to Bethesda's new take, a bunch of the original story ideas and concepts absolutely could. Nevada and the Hoover Dam were locations conjured up during pre-production on the original 3, as was Kaisar's Legion being the major new faction. It helped that the intended game director Josh Sawyer also served as the director for New Vegas as well, meaning that the original Fallout 3 was able to be realised in one form or another. Number 9. Ghouls and Super Mutants were originally playable one of the genius parts of New Vegas is that you truly have the option to make your character whoever the hell you want. Unlike 3's Vault Dweller who had a defined origin and family, the career's personality and history could be whatever you wanted it to be, and Obsidian's original plans expanded that freedom even further. Back when it was known as Fallout Sin City, the spin-off would let players pick between three different races, human, ghoul, and super mutant. It's a concept that surprisingly has yet to be realised in a Fallout game, especially considering other Bethesda titles let you pick between different races. Sadly, issues with the Gambrio engine meant that Obsidian didn't have the time to implement three different unique classes, and in the end just went with the regular old human protagonist. Number 8. One perk is literally useless. New Vegas's perk system is pretty versatile, but there is one you absolutely should not pick. 
Shining Armor is supposed to give an extra 5 points to the damage threshold against energy weapons while wearing any metal armor, but due to the in-game parameters being wrongly set, it actually provides no buff at all. Essentially, the perk is programmed to assess whether the files of enemy weapons are named energy to recognize whether the buff should be added, but the problem is that these guns in the game are actually recognized as energy weapons in the game's files. While that's the biggest bug, other perks also also didn't work as intended for a time either, including Educated and Ninja. Number 7. It was made in only 18 months Speaking of bugs, a big reason why New Vegas was so broken at launch was because Bethesda only gave Obsidian 18 months to actually make it. In a way, that was almost setting them up to fail. While the assets from 3 were reused, Bethesda's own RPGs usually take around 4 years to create, and Obsidian had less than half of that time and had to use an engine that they weren't familiar with. You could argue that that time frame should have made the team pull back on their ambitions, and for instance there are almost 20,000 more lines of dialogue in New Vegas than in 3, but you can't blame the team for shooting for the stars, especially after losing this franchise once before. Number 6. Benny is based on a real person Benny is one of video games' greatest slippery toads. Him shooting you in the head and leaving you for dead is already all the justification you need to track him down, but Obsidian made him a character you absolutely love to chase across the Mojave Wasteland. The characterization feels so truthful though, partly because Benny was actually based on a real-life person, Benjamin Bugsy Siegel. Despite both having a love of checkered black and white suits and let's face it, why wouldn't you, the two also built their legacy around the Vegas Strip. Bugsy in real life is considered one of the architects of modern Vegas, financing casinos and overseeing the construction of certain landmarks. He was also a lifelong mobster, dipping his toes into everything from alcohol smuggling during the Prohibition era to assassinations before settling on gambling as his crime major. The similarities between the two are striking, and Benny is just one of many characters in the game with real-world inspirations. Number 5. Matthew Perry was actually a huge fan of the franchise. I've mentioned Matthew Perry's Benny multiple times in this list so far, but the actor's relationship with the game goes far deeper than him merely being a bit of stunt casting. In fact, it wasn't his name or performance at all that resulted in him being courted for the role, but how much the actor actually loved this franchise. He appeared on The Ellen DeGeneres Show back in 2009 to promote his movie 17 again, and while there ended up professing his undying love for Fallout 3, even giving Ellen a copy of the game along along with an Xbox 360. Why? I have absolutely no idea, but you know what, good for him. This stunt though apparently drew the attention of the top brass at Bethesda, who then drafted him in for New Vegas. Unfortunately, his performance as Benny in the game is, well, to be polite, it's a little bit flat. You would have hoped that the enthusiasm for the series would have resulted in a better performance, but in my opinion, that just didn't happen. Sorry Matthew, I'm sure you're a lovely dude. Number 4. There's a Planet of the Apes ending I've tried to keep away from easter eggs on this list so far because they're by far the biggest hidden secrets that get shared about the Fallout franchise and at this point fans just kinda know them all. They know about the corpse of Indiana Jones found in a fridge and they know about the skeletons of Luke Skywalker's aunt and uncle being burnt to a crisp. That said though, the Planet of the Apes ending was just too fun to leave off, and the fact that it's located in the very last DLC means there's more of a chance people out there won't know what it is. The final choice of that story capper has you deciding what to do with a bunch of nuclear missiles set to imminently launch. And if you have the Wild Wasteland perk equipped, you can pick an option that destroys Kaiser's Legion, the NCR, and everything in between. If you do go rogue and blow everything up, you'll be treated to a special slideshow set against an image that mirrors the ending of the original Planet of the Apes, and a voiceover which explains the devastating consequences of your actions. Number 3. Bethesda considered it a failure it kind of feels like Bethesda just doesn't want to acknowledge New Vegas at all these days. When discussing the franchise, the company only ever references the games it built, and it didn't seem to take any inspiration from Obsidian spin-off while making either Fallout 4 or 76. Probably for the best with that last one, maybe. That could be because the relationship between Obsidian and Bethesda at the time wasn't all that good. Great. The deal in place way back when was that Obsidian only received an upfront payment to make the game, 
with no royalty scheme in place and a bonus only promised if New Vegas ended up hitting 85 on Metacritic. Its eventual score was 84, and they didn't get a penny from Bethesda. Of course, the terms of the contract were clear and the company owed the team nothing, but it has become a point of contention for developers who worked on the title. As New Vegas was a huge commercial success and the lack of royalties or bonus didn't help when Obsidian had to lay off tens of their staff in the few years following. Number two, there was a huge endgame plan that had to be cut. Considering New Vegas never shies away from doling out consequences to your actions, it's kind of strange that the game doesn't continue after your final decisions in the main story, which radically altered the state of the Mojave. As always, this wasn't the initial plan, and Obsidian originally had an entire endgame mapped out that ended up being condensed into the final slideshow presentation. A whole bunch of files remained in the finished version though, referencing the planned post-game content, which wouldn't have shaken up the experience massively, but would have allowed you to continue playing and observe how different characters reacted to your decisions. For instance, Mr. New Vegas had a whole bunch of new stories detailing the fallout, no pun intended, of the climax, while enemies would have shown up in different locations as well. Even worse, expanded endgame content set in the regular Mojave Wasteland was also planned as DLC, until that too was canned in favour of self-contained stories so the devs could work on fixing the core game. Man, just imagine Imagine how good this title would have been if it had more than 18 months in development. Seriously, it's it's like the biggest crime ever. Number one, scrapped companion romance options were pretty hilarious. Companions are easily one of New Vegas's biggest strengths, and in pre-production, having romance options for these characters was also toyed with. Rather than making serious romantic escapades, Obsidian's idea was to let the courier have a bunch of strange and wacky encounters with members of their own party. While these stories didn't get too far along in development before they were canned, one involving Cass was revealed by Josh Sawyer. The idea was that Cass and the courier would go out and get blackout drunk one night, and then get married on a whim at the King's School of Impersonation, while an Elvis track played in the background, no less. That would have been awesome to see, but in the end, nobody on the team was really that enamoured with the romance quests, and they were eventually dropped. I mean, I have no idea why, because the idea of that impromptu wedding is just, it's just too tantalising. Why didn't that make it into the game? Come on, Josh. So that's our list. I want to know what you guys think down in the comments below. Did you know these Fallout New Vegas facts or have they enlightened you about one of your favorite games? Either way, while you're down there, could you give us a like, share, subscribe, and head over to whatculture.com for more lists and news like this every single day. Even if you don't, though, I've been Josh. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you soon.